In this week's episode, I'll be guiding you along the process used to create this original oil painting. And at the same time, the process will be divided into five categories, that is five ways to improve your oil paintings. And if you would like to see a list of all of the colors that I'm using, please refer to the description box down below where I'll have all that information typed up for you. Now then, loosen up. That's going to be the first way we're going to improve our oil paintings. What you want to do is learn to reason with simple shapes. Simple straight lines and angles can depict so much information so quickly. Learn to relate shapes rather than to merely copy what you're looking at. Also, while you're doing this, you will learn how to feel out proportion. This is a little microfiber cloth that I'm using just to uh, take out some of the charcoal, which by the way, I'm just using vine charcoal to draw these simple shapes. As you can see, very loosely drawing those simple shapes. No how to build from simple to complex. See how the little element of clothing that we're actually going to edit later on, you're seeing how it's just a few simple straight lines and angles. So in this way, we're going to be building the superstructure from simple to complex. That's one of the most important things to look at when you're looking into improving your oil paintings. You will find that you will enable yourself to have a sense of freedom when you do this. Now, the color value web. But before we get too far into the color value web, I would like to talk to you about my Patreon. So if you would like to see behind the scenes footage, behind the scenes episodes uploaded weekly, please check out patreon.com along with new online classes beginning Mondays on my Patreon account. For those of you already on Patreon, this will be added to the benefits for the mentor tier level. So those of you that are mentor tier patrons, nothing will change for you, but you will have the addition of having these online classes. New classes will be uploaded every Monday, and each project will have specific steps to complete each assignment and you'll also have the ability to send me images every week just like you would in a in a regular in-person class you'll be able to contact me for feedback in the class and the first online class will be available this Monday now returning to the color value web it's not too complicated to see it's simply value arrangement from left to right keeping those values organized is going to help us tremendously in keeping our colors well organized on the palette this now leads us to our third category which is paint handling now before i go any further the photo reference will be given to you in a link in the description box down below or you can go ahead and check out uh, pexels Dot com. They have copyright free images for artists to use as well as other commercial purposes. They are copyright free images that you can use. Now then, for paint handling, you want to know your approach. Is it direct painting or indirect painting? This would be considered direct painting. The reason I use direct painting here and in most of my work is because that it is more efficient, it's much faster, but the trade-off is it's much more difficult when it comes to paint handling. Now in terms of paint handling, you want to know your medium, thinner, and your paint ratios to your medium and thinner. Are you using a fast dryer or a slow dryer? For instance, in the painting here, you're seeing as I'm developing these shapes using direct painting. My medium, though you cannot see it, my medium is a fast dryer. It is a walnut alkyd medium. I prefer to use fast dryers just because I like my paint to be dry pretty quickly. Uh, in about a day or two, I want the paint to be ready to rework. And you want to know exactly how much medium to use which in this case in the first layer you don't want to use too much you want to know how to build your layers and speaking of building your layers we're going to return to this topic later on in the episode as this painting will involve 
two layers. In general, when you're working with oil paints, if you paint a little bit thinner in your first layer, as I'm doing here in the, the first layer of the painting, the painting will tend to dry a little bit faster. Also, if you use a moderate amount of fast drying medium, not a lot, but if you use tiny bits of fast drying medium, it actually will help it dry faster than using a whole lot of fast drying medium, which can have the opposite effect. What you're seeing me do here is subtract. You can also do subtractive uh, applications of paint. Well, you can subtract paint, basically. So I was using paper towel to subtract uh, for the sunglasses, and it kind of worked perfectly uh, with the reddish color that was already in the hair. And now we're starting to layer a little bit more of the highlights onto the uh, the forehead and the frontal planes of the face. Now I want to be very clear about this next thing that I'm going to say about paint handling. It is a little bit of a complex thing to talk about, but the relationship between line and mass is something that I want to talk about in terms of paint handling. So working with line with a linear construct is more of a classical approach, and that's working from the outside in. You draw the outside shapes and then fill them in. When you're working with mass, you're working the inside out, those smaller shapes with direct painting. And then, as you're seeing here, going in with a smaller brush all the way to the contours, you're outlining the outside shapes, which in turn does the same exact thing. So whether you're working with a super finished linear drawing doesn't matter. Now you're seeing from the uh, front region, so now the camera is actually front and center. We're starting to put in some of these brush strokes for the sunglasses. Now let's move on to composition. Composition is really the first thing that you want to think about in terms of creating your own original artwork. And what you're seeing me do here is mix up uh, fast matte titanium white with permanent rose and a little bit of alizarin permanent or alizarin crimson and other colors and I'm going to use this for the background color. The reason why I introduced composition a little bit later in the episode is because it's finally starting to show in the painting in the fact that I flattened out the background and made it a different color. I didn't go with the color in the photo reference in the background. And as you're going to see here, I'm going to edit the way that the, uh, the hair looks and the way that the drapery will look in the painting. You ready for a magic trick? Boom. But in all seriousness, composition can be easily overdone and it can be something that can uh, hold you back sometimes. At least it's held me back in the past. And as you're seeing me fill in some of the half tones for the arm, composition is something that really is a matter of feel. It's something that you feel through the brush, through the brushes, so to speak. And of course, you can map out your compositions in a, in a study, but sometimes you just want to feel what you're putting onto the canvas, react to the canvas, and in a sense, that can make your work much more creative in that you're not overthinking every single aspect of your picture. And this next little bit of advice is a very important thing, especially to those of us that are, uh, we consider ourselves realist painters. The next thing is to understand that technique is only one attribute to composition. So just because we can paint a perfect head or a perfect hand or a perfect figure, it's almost meaningless if we just have the head or the figure or the hand or whatever floating around in empty space that is floating around on a blank canvas. Now all I did was flatten out the background in this painting but I wanted the flatness of the background along with the abstract quality of the clothing. As you can see the model is actually emerging out of an abstract painting. 
the rest of her hair and the rest of her shirt is flat in contrast with the color of the face and the color and the form on the arm. You must understand that creating something that looks super realistic but doesn't relate to some kind of visual communication on a canvas is empty. So this canvas I want to convey something specific. I want it to convey a sense of emotion. I want the eye to travel in a specific way. I don't want the eye to just say figure, blank canvas, or figure, background, couch, a picture in the background. Okay, so this is a perfect Kodiak moment. I don't want that. I want there to be some kind of visual ambience to the painting that is intriguing to the audience. Now I promised that I would return to the topic of layering. And in this painting, this is now actually the second layer. You're seeing footage from the second layer. And I didn't oil out the painting as you're seeing the darks for the hair didn't sink into the canvas as much as some of my older paintings may have. And that is because I managed to use just enough medium in the hair in the first layer so that the darks wouldn't sink in to the canvas too much. And now as I'm layering the painting, I want you to take note of something very important. When you're layering a painting, be strategic with where you work first. I'm working with the half tones first. I'm essentially going right into the rendering stage of this painting. And it's through the development of these half tones that I can achieve a little bit more of a sense of realism in the face. And that's all I'm going to work on in the second sitting is the realism, the half tones for the side of the face. I do consider other artists in my uh, pursuit of composition. I thought of Vermeer's girl with a pearl earring with the head turned. Of course, uh, Vermeer's was turned in the other direction, looking right out of the canvas. And I also have a lot of consideration for Nelson Shanks' colors and flat colors that he used in his backgrounds. So when you're trying to plan out your own compositions, take into consideration what the great masters have done in the past. And don't copy what they did but try to understand what they did and see how you can push that forward into your own original works. So our discussion of composition is coming to a close very soon but as you're starting to see the half tones being um, painted onto the surface of the uh, uh, on the dry painting so I'm working wet onto dry Remember the thing that I want to constantly reiterate is that technique is only one attribute to composition. You can consider all of the hundreds of hours that you have spent learning how to create a painting that reflects something that you're observing in nature or a photograph, but you need to consider the fact that in the end of the day or maybe the next century or centuries later when people are observing your paintings there's going to be something that grabs their attention something that grabs their attention and they just don't know why it just does it communicates with us in a way that you can't really communicate with words and that is visual communication through our oil paintings now we're actually going to transition into talking about this specific process that has been used to create this painting thus far. So in the beginning, I did what I could with simple shape, simple masses of color, and built the painting directly, working with thinner paint, but still balancing how much paint to uh, medium I was using as well as the paint thinner I wasn't painting with a completely loaded brush instead I was trying to build enough of a surface that would dry within a reasonable amount of time so the the gap between the first session and the second session was um, exactly 
one day. So I was away from this painting for exactly one day, and it was able to be reworked later on. And as I said earlier, building from simple to specific, from the most basic to the more complex, now you're starting to see the development of the more complex. And in particular, notice what I'm doing here. That's right, I'm going to the contours. See? Working from the inside shapes to the outside shapes. It would have been the exact same, but maybe a little bit less fun for me, had I drawn out all of the outlines perfectly and then filled them in. It would have had perhaps the same result, but it may not have been as much fun for me to paint in that way. And that's really up to you, how you want to create your own paintings. So allow me to explain a little bit more in what is it going on exactly in the painting. So what's going on is that I'm painting, in, I'm intentionally painting an edge into the side of the face. I'm trying to put in value per value, trying to think of the subtlety of the curvature of the side of the model's face. This is very very important when it comes to the three-dimensionality of the image that you're looking at. So when you saw the footage in the beginning of the episode, what made the face look more realistic is this step. Notice this step. And that's it. Being able to balance the subtlety between the half tones and understanding the structures rather than merely copying the photo reference is what makes the painting look more volumetric. And this is one of those topics that I can't really talk about as efficiently in a typical YouTube video. So this is definitely a topic that I'm going to get more in depth in the classes on Patreon. But now let's talk about impasto. This is going to be the fifth and final way to improve your oil paintings that we're going to talk about in this episode. And I know what you're thinking, what on earth did I just do? I put, <laughs> I put in a spot of straight titanium white, very thick titanium white, onto the cheekbone. Well, what I'm doing is I'm mixing directly onto the surface of the painting. I first put in the titanium white. This would work much, much better with flake white, though you can use flake white or titanium white, it just matters how you, all that matters is how you balance your coloring, that's all. What I did first was put in straight titanium white, very thick paint, and then I put in flesh color from my palette and mixed directly onto the surface of the painting. And you're seeing me do that once again by the nasal bone know that this will dry slowly. So again, talking about layering, when it comes to impasto, you don't necessarily, though you could, but you don't necessarily want to start with impasto in your first layer. If you're going to be working on a painting multiple times, save the impasto for somewhere in the middle layers so you can continue to build. See, straight titanium white, and now flesh color and mixing directly onto the nose. Imagine the areas that protrude more and build their layers more thick. So the nose protrudes more, the cheekbones protrude more. So I'm building those layers more thick. A really great example for this type of painting is Rembrandt. If you look at the close-ups of Rembrandt paintings, that is an excellent way to learn uh, which areas would benefit more from impasto painting. This also helps to expand the value range because putting straight titanium white is the ceiling. It's the brightest area on a painting and when you just tweak it just a little bit by putting flesh tone you're making sure that you don't have straight titanium white, but you have a very bright and vibrant color to have as an impasto effect. Also, keep in mind glare. Glare is another thing that can be kind of annoying with oil paintings, and that is the tendency of oil paintings to reflect light. So specifically, I'm putting my brush strokes in 
a specific direction so that it doesn't glare for the camera. So I do have to paint with consideration for how the glare will affect the way that the painting looks when it's photographed, or in this case, the way the painting looks on camera. And now for the last bit of painting footage, I'm going to leave with this front and center view of the face. The camera is front and center. I can't always paint with the camera front and center because I have to lean over the camera, which isn't that fun. So what I'm doing here is just adjusting one final edge below the lower lip, trying to make that edge as soft as possible. Now let's just drop in the old signature and call this a completed oil painting. I really hope that this week's episode helps you out. I wish you the best in all of your artwork. If you would like to see more painting videos like this, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you would like to watch live painting demonstrations and take online classes with me, along with many other benefits, please check out my Patreon account. There will be a link in the description box down below to my Patreon, or you can feel free to just go ahead and type in patreon.com slash upariartist and you'll be able to find it very easily. With that being said, it is now time for our new patron shout out. So thank you. Thank you to this week's new patron, Lewis. Thank you so much for your support on my Patreon account. Don't forget to check out this week's behind the scene episode. Thank you so much for your support and I'll see you on the next episode.